Hey guys, how are you? Uncle Steph here. So an article from Futurism, I'll link to it below. Inventor of Vibe Coding admits he hand-coded his new project. So that's uh, very interesting, right? This, of course, puts into question the whole Vibe Coding paradigm. And uh, so in this video, we're going to go over some of the bullet points of this article. And uh, I'm going to give you my two cents about how this impacts software development in general, how it impacts AI-based development, etc. and so on. Uh, long and short of it, it does not change my perspective from the very first day that AI came out and people were going, ah, oh, coding's over. Let me just read the article and we'll get into the commentary. So earlier this year, former a open AI exec Andrzej Karparthy coined a new term, vibe coding, for using artificial intelligence to rapidly develop software using natural language prompts. But the approach comes with some glaring shortcomings that have gradually come to light. From major cybersecurity problems leading to mass leaking of sensitive data, rampant hallucinations that turn vibe coded projects into a buggy mess that has been painstakingly, that has to be painstakingly fixed by human programmers. So that's one thing I've seen actually I've heard from multiple people saying they got hired to fix vibe coded, uh, well, AI coded projects. So here's a basic lesson of software development that is screaming at me based on this vibe coding, AI coding problem where you got all kinds of messy code that has to be reworked and debugged and so forth. One of the oldest principles of software engineering is something called the um, separation of concerns. The separation of concerns. What does that mean? That's a fancy nerd way of saying that you should keep your code uh, segmented and fragmented by use. So for example, let's go down, we'll drop, drop down into the object level of software development. Um, if you are building a class that handles authentication, have it handle only authentication. Don't inject into your authenticator classes a bunch of code on view generation, for example, or on persistence, for example. Persistence is a fancy way of saying accessing the database. So you're gonna have some code here that deals with all the authentication, and then you'd have some code here that handles all the database access. You don't mix them up, you keep them separate. In this case, segregation is good. So that way you keep them separate and they talk to each other, but they're separate. Now the problem with uh, a lot of the vibe coding and the AI coding is people who use them, they use them improperly. They forget the fundamental principle that we just discussed, separation of concerns. You have to keep your, um, your task segregated. So what I did, uh, as I always do, and what I suggest you do, when you want to explore new technology, so because I wanted to explore AI, what I did is I decided to create my own custom AI first implementation. Implementation is a fancy way of an application. So I built a fitness coach, an AI fitness coach, very powerful. It can do things that I could not have done without AI. And it has a lot to do with the uh, image recognition and so forth. So I built this thing. It's called Brad Fit. It's uh, pretty cool stuff. Anyhow. And I built it, A, because uh, I wanted to learn prompt engineering and understand what it, what it was like. This was based on GPT. And B, I wanted a fitness AI coach for my own purposes. Because, you know, as you get old and decrepit like me, you learn that health and fitness is very important. So I wanted to automate certain processes. So anyway, I built it with the, I built the fitness AI uh, it's in my Fit Over 50 program. Anyhow, um, it took me about three and a half, four months. And what I discovered by working with the AI every day for three and a half, four months, not you know half an hour a day, two hours a day, something like that, I discovered that you had to be, you had to really adhere to adhere to the principle of separation of concerns. You have to make sure that your code is segmented. You don't try to do too many things because then the, the AIs, the, the models just go absolutely wild. They just go off on these tangents. They start hallucinating. Anybody who's got experience in software will tell you that last 
makes all the difference in terms of the quality of the software. Meaning, you can get 90% of the way there with your software, but if you don't solve that last 10%, it ain't going to work. So the article uh, continues, even Karparthi himself has seemingly fallen out of love with his own creation, his latest project dubbed NanoChat. You boot up the cloud graphics processing unit box, run a single script, and in as little as four hours, you can talk to your own large language model in ChatGPT-like web UI. So anyway, that's his application. Uh, but as it turns out, the project wasn't the result of AI vibe coding. It was Karpathy, Karpathy himself, excuse me. It's basically entirely handwritten, quote, Karpathy wrote in the fall. I tried to use Claude and Codex agents a few times, but they just didn't work well enough at all, and nets were unhelpful. Possibly the repo is too far off the data distribution. In other words, even the godfather uh, vibe coding doesn't trust the tech enough to use it for his own projects. To be fair, even Karpathy himself never intended for vibe coding to replace human developers in the long run. Sometimes the LLMs can fix a bug, so I just work around, excuse me, sometimes the LLMs can't fix a bug, so I just work around it or ask for random changes until it goes away. He wrote in a tweet recently, it's not too bad. It's not too bad for throwaway weekend projects, but it's still quite uh, amusing. The article continues, but over relying on the technique can have disastrous consequences as companies continue to cut costs in favor of investing in AI, regardless of Carpathy's original intentions. A growing number of coders are being tasked with fixing AI hallucinating code or well, AI hallucinate code. At best, projects never reach a satisfying level of polish. At worst, the shoddy put together lines of code can wipe out entire databases. Yeah, that happens. Researchers have also found that AI-assisted coding can actually slow down human developers instead of boosting their productivity. AI-based generated code is essentially doing exactly what all code-generating tools have done for the last 20 years. It's unbelievable. I've been a developer for 30 years, if you don't know. Since 94, 95, I started getting paid to code or made money with code. So yeah, same old, same so same old. So the way to use AI-generated code it is to use it in very finite use cases. Don't try to build everything. You may have an, an agent, an AI agent do this, and then another one does just this, this thing here. So it can speed it up. The mistake people make is they try to do it have it do the whole thing, that can get pretty bad. Again, if you're building a, an app that's a one-off, that uh, probably won't need updating, something super quick and simple, yeah, then definitely look at AI to generate that. But if you have a fairly complex system, use AI to assist you. So that means you gotta know what you're doing. Use it to assist you. And of course, the other option, like I did with my AI fitness coach, you want to, uh, where you have AI first type of application, uh, then, uh, then that makes sense as well. But again, that should be finite. So my fitness AI coach doesn't try to do 20 different things. It does just a couple of things, does it really well. But the reason it does it, it, does it really well it, is because it does just a couple of things. So there you go. Um, when the dust settles with the AI stuff, they're starting to discover its limitations and its capabilities. There's gonna be a third tranche of developer called the uh, AI, well, it's gonna be AI developers. Um, let me, I drew, I drew out this fancy graphic here, which I think you'll be impressed with. Look at the quality of the art here, it's unbelievable. So, so you got three things here. So up until 1994, thick client, development was the game. Thick client, Windows development mostly, although some Mac, some Linux, but I don't even, I don't even know if Linux was around then. But anyway, thick client development, that was the name of the game, VB6, C++, Windows. Then in 1994, web dev came in. So that's me with my long hair. I got into the game early on, and because Uncle Steph at the time, well, I was Cousin Steph, I was jumping into the new game called web dev, um, 1994 and up, I made a lot of money. 
it was very lucrative time time to be a, a young developer because it was so new. Most people were still doing this. A lot of people doing thick client were saying, ah, this sucks, this sucks. But I said, no, 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 that's the future. I would walk into jobs in this time frame, and people would ask me, I would say, hey, you should get a, you should get a website. And they would look at me and go, what's a website? So that's how early it was, but it turned out to be very good. Now, I had long hair as the depicted here, but then between this time and this time here, or this time here, uh, something happened. I wrote some Ruby code, wrote a couple of Ruby apps, and you know, there we go. Uh, so now, 2025, we are in the AI age. Now, AI is not the panacea yet that people are claiming it is, meaning it's not replacing all coders. It means that the smart developers are jumping into the AI space and understanding what this technology can do for you. AI-assisted coding of traditional methods, and of course, AI first development, like my uh, fitness agent, uh, excuse me, my fitness G GP, my fitness GPT. So there you go, that's the story. Um, if you're a noob today, learn your foundations. I always recommend the web because it offers the most opportunity. And then get into uh, AI based development, learn how to use AI to speed up your learning, to speed up the process. I used AI recently, for example, I had a bug on one of my legacy apps, uh, an old form. So what, how did I use AI? What I did is I, uh, because I'm a software developer, I said, okay, let's get the log file. So I dumped the log file from the server, huge log file, huge log file. So what I did was uh, I grabbed it, I threw it up to GPT and I say, hey, I had this error here. I forget what the error was. And I said, uh, here's the log file. What do you think the problems are? It went here, 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 and it found it right away. So instead of me spending half an hour going through a log file, I was able to get my answer from a GPT in like, you know, two seconds. So then I said, okay, that's good. I got to change some configs here. I got to re rewrite a little HT access. And he even told me, so you got to rewrite the HT access. So, I, so it was a... Uh, Commercial form software, I didn't own, I bought it, licensed it, but it's self-hosted. So I was, uh, so it knew, it's okay, I'm using this form here. Are there, is there more, multiple config files in this particular, uh, in this particular software? And it was able to go on the web and pull the answer. So I could have done this the old fashioned way via Google, but that would have maybe taken me 20 minutes or so. Uh, AI got it done in like a, you know, ten seconds. It went on the web, scan. Blah, blah, blah. It's okay. You got it. You got an eye on it here. You got a config here. So you got to you got to set it here. All right, go. Boom. There it is. Boom. Okay. Write this in. Put this rule there. It was able to provide this for me. But the thing is, I still needed to know what I was doing. I had to know what questions to ask, and I had to be comfortable going in there. You know, setting permissions and so on. But it just got me to the answers that normally I would have had to Google. Uh, I had to use Google to get the answers to, and so this is much more, much more, uh, much more efficient. Hey guys, I'm Uncle Steph. I teach people software development. I teach people uh, how to get jobs, how to write better code. Everything I teach, by the way, is based on personal experience of being in the game for decades as a uh, tech entrepreneur. So what I've done over the decades is basically build passive income based businesses. I have a few that are running now. I have some who's been running, I've wanted to be running for like 25 years, amazingly to me. Um, and I just put them out there, boom, 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 and you know, they generate income and that's what I do. I continue to do it because it's a hobby for me. So yeah, one last piece of advice if you're getting into the coding game or anything really, find what you like Find that's something that's enjoyable, so that you, if it's a hobbyish, if if you will, uh, but it has to be valuable too. You, 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 your hobby may be to draw pictures of I don't know Spider Man, but there's not much money in that. So you got to find something that's fun, you enjoy doing, uh, but it also has to be profitable. So you have to explore that a little bit. Anyway, I'll talk about that in other videos. So there you go. Cheers.